Welcome to episode 10 of Real Health Radio. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey, and welcome to Real Health Radio. I'm your host, Chris Sandel, and this week's show is another one where I'm doing it on my own, and I'm speaking about a particular topic. And this week is all about keeping a food log and why I think it can be such a useful tool. It really is the backbone of the stuff that I do with clients. Well, at least for the clients where it's more straight up nutrition and less so for the disordered eating clients. And I barely use supplements with people. It's really about food and lifestyle. So the food log is hugely important for this. And I honestly don't know how nutritionists are able to do what they do if someone's not regularly keeping a food log for them between sessions because of just how important it is for me. So in today's show, I'll explain the things that you should be keeping a tally on, why they're important, and how you can then use this information to improve your health. Um, But before we jump into this, I want to set some ground rules and explain the way I go about this as it's rather different to the way that most people do it. So the majority of people who've kept a food log in the past or who are currently doing it and normally doing it from a place of control, that they're keeping a log to make sure that they don't eat more than 1,600 calories or so that they don't eat too much sugar or something along these lines. And this is not why I get clients to keep a food log. I get them to do it because I think it's a really incredibly powerful tool for someone becoming more in tune with their body and to get to a place where they can intuitively eat and that this is genuinely supporting them. And if people are able to do this without a food log, then that's great. But from my experience, I find that most people just can't get to this place nearly as quickly or with the same level of understanding in comparison if they did keep a food log. So when I get clients to keep a food log, I'm very explicit about what it is for and what it's about. It's not about judgment in the way that most people think of the word judgment. It's not about looking and seeing if they had cake and that cake's bad or if they had some porridge for breakfast and that porridge is good. It's not about this stuff. It's about looking at what they're doing and then objectively analyzing that stuff to work out what is and isn't working for them. And with some clients, some of the people who I'm seeing come because of disordered eating. And while there are occasions with these clients that I don't get them to keep a log, most of the time I still do. But again, I'm really explicit about the fact that this isn't about judgment and restriction and the other negatives that they've normally been keeping a food log for. And we want to use the food log to help them as part of their recovery. And this is something I'm going to go into more detail uh, towards the end of this show. And I'll explain how and why I use it in these situations and how it can be helpful. But to start with, I want to look at it more in the traditional straight up health perspective perspective sense. I'm going to be adding the food log that I use to clients, uh, with clients, sorry, uh, to the show notes. I actually use two different logs with people. There's a basic one that we start off with, and then there's more of an advanced one that we use in the later stages of working together. And this is so people can input calories and just goes into much more detail. But the one I'm going to be including in the show notes is the basic one as the more advanced one takes a little bit of explaining of how to use it. And so when you open up this basic food log, there's a section where there's some columns that say CPNF. Um, You can just ignore that stuff and you can just include the things that I then go through in this show when using it. Um, The log that is going to be in the show notes, um, it's an Excel document, um, but it should open in in notes for Mac users that don't have Excel. Um, If you can't get it to open, if neither of these work for you, drop me an email and I can then share it with you in Google Drive. And the final thing I'll say before jumping into the actual food log and what to keep is how often to actually keep one. I typically recommend that clients do a food log three days a week. 
And this is plenty of time for people to pick up information without becoming burnt out on it. There are clients that keep it more and some clients actively want to keep it more even when I say you don't need to. But for most people, if they're trying to do a food log every day, um, pretty shortly they get burnt out on it and they don't want to be keeping a food log ever again. So three days a week is typically enough for us to get some good information and for you to get some good information about what is and isn't working and to analyze it in the way that I'm going to go through now. So let's get started then. So the first thing you want to do is be putting down what you actually ate. And I know that's pretty obvious, but that's where you need to start. And you should be including everything you eat. So that's main meals, that's snacks, even if there's a cracker you eat in the afternoon or half an orange or something really small and innocuous, I still think you should be including it as log. And What I will add to this is a log should be a fair reflection of what you really do. Don't just log on good days and think, yeah, I'm I'm gonna really doing the right thing, so I'm gonna definitely log today. Or you get halfway through a day and things start to go badly and you're not eating the way that you would like, and you think, oh, I'll just scratch doing the log today, I'll start tomorrow. Because if you're doing that, you're not giving a true reflection of how you'd normally eat. So you should be including the good days, the bad days, and everything in between and using that information to work out what is and isn't working for you. And if you do different things in the week versus the weekend, then it's worth logging both of those days. If you do different things in uh, your exercise days versus your non-exercise days, then you want to make sure this stuff is covered. So when you're doing the three days a week, make sure that it covers across the board the different styles that you eat um, on different days. And one of the recommendations I make just in a general sense with with eating is that people should be having complete meals and snacks. And what I mean by this is when someone's having something to eat, that there should be some carbohydrates, some protein and some fat there. And most of the time, people just need to think about the carbs and protein. They don't need to think about the fat because most of the proteins people are eating come with fat attached. If someone's having some meat, if someone's having some eggs, if they're having some dairy, etc., all of these are proteins that have fat attached. So the fat doesn't need to be thought about so much. It's more the carbs and protein. So when you're starting to look at the foods that you're eating and the way that you're structuring things, one of the first most simple things you can look at is, Am I actually having complete meals at each of my meals and snacks? Is there carbs, proteins, and fats there? And alongside the meals and the snacks, you also want to be including the times that you're eating. And meal times are really important to me. And I think there's so little attention paid to how people structure their eating versus just what's actually included. And I think this has changed more in recent time because of things like intermittent fasting. But it appears that the only people who are actually looking at their meal timings are more people who are doing it from from that end and not people who are eating in a more conventional way. And the reason that I think the meal time is so important is you're wanting to start to determine how often do I need to be eating each day? How many hours can I be going between my meals? Should I be eating every three hours? What happens if I go every five hours? And starting to analyze that. So if you're not including the times of your meals on the logs, you're not able to be able to do that. Because really, you could have two people who eat the exact same food across a day, but do it in very different ways in terms of the timings and the structure, and they will have completely different results. I would also add with meal timings, you'll probably notice that the amount of time you go between meals or need to go between meals can also change at different points out of the day. So it might be in the first half of the day, you need to be eating more frequently. But come afternoon, evening time, you can get away with longer gaps or vice versa. So having that information there is really crucial so that you can start to make those um, judgments and determinations. I also think that it's important to include the time that you're going to bed and that you're waking up. Um, This can be useful to see, like, obviously how much sleep you're actually getting. And I think sleep is one of the most important things for people's health and one of the most under 
valued things in people's life. They, they're always looking at how can I be having green smoothies or how can I be eating organic or changing all of these different things around their food and their diet. And yet someone can be getting six hours sleep a night or going to bed at one o'clock each night or going to bed at 12, but after spending three or four hours on a computer. So sleep is incredibly important. And at least on the log, by having that information there, you can get a bit of a gauge of the timings with someone's sleep and how much sleep they're getting. Um, I also find that the timings with sleep can then also come into play or become useful in terms of looking at meal timings. So you can look at the point at which you woke up versus the point at which you first had something to eat. So did you wake up at six o'clock in the morning and then have your breakfast half an hour later or was it not until say nine or 9.30 or 10 o'clock and we're talking about a three hour gap? And so if you don't have the timings for when you went to bed and got up, you're not going to be able to make that determination. And I'd say the same thing with your last meal at night and before going to bed. So when did you last eat before going to sleep? Are you having dinner at six o'clock at night and then going to bed at 10.30 or 11, where you've then got a four and a half hour, five hour, six hour gap, depending on those timings. And so I think that can be really important because there's lots of things that you can pick up because of that. If I'm seeing that someone's going to to bed at 10.30, they had their last meal at six o'clock and they're having trouble sleeping, my first thought might be that you need to be eating closer towards your bedtime. And it might be that you have your main meal there, but you need to have another snack before going to bed and trying that out. Um, looking at in terms of the timings between when someone had their last meal or when someone has their first meal the next day, because it's not uncommon when I do this with people that they notice that there's a 14 or a 15 hour gap between those two. So they have dinner at six and then they have their first meal the next day at eight o'clock or nine o'clock. And for most people, this is way too long for them to be able to, um, to be going between those meals. And again, it can be then leading into why someone's having real poor sleep patterns or they're feeling really tired and take a long time to get going in the morning, etc. So having that information down there in terms of timings makes a real difference. The next thing I would say is part of the food log, you want to be including things that link into your symptoms and how you're feeling. And this can be physical stuff. So marking down that you're getting bloating or you've got cold hands and feet or you're getting headaches. So the the pretty obvious stuff, it could be mental stuff as well. So I'm having real troubles concentrating in the first half of the morning, or I'm having really good times in the afternoon, or um, my focus is best at these hours of the day. Whatever you start to pick up, put it down on the log. Um, And then from an emotional perspective, looking at you know what, how often are you getting changes in your emotion? What are the emotions that are coming up? Are you getting angry or frustrated or sad or um, teary or whatever it may be? And just putting that information down because the more notes and information you can have, the better. Because when I'm working with a client, obviously I want to have that information. But even if you're doing this stuff on your own, a lot of what you'll do with the logs and why they become important is you then look back on this stuff. So when you're looking back in a month's time, you're not going to remember all of that stuff that was going on throughout the day. But if you've actually logged it down, you can then reflect on it. And you can then reflect on what's happening now versus what was happening a month ago. And that can be really invaluable. So I always get people to mark down as much information as possible. And you can be putting down things like this was happening all throughout the day, or this started at this time and it stopped at that time. Um, But any extra information just is so so crucial for being able to get the most out of this. If someone's getting certain ongoing issues, I'll get them to mark it down so we can see it from a quantitative perspective. So an example of this would be if someone's saying they're getting constipation all the time, they're often going two or three or four days without passing a stool, I'll get them to mark that stuff down. So on the log, it'll say no stool today or stool at 10 p.m. or whenever it may be. Um, So that when we then start to look at it, we can look at, okay, this week you went twice. 
the week after, you went three times. Two months down the line, you're going six out of seven days a week. And so having that information there, and if people are only logging three days a week, then sometimes they'll have to keep this information somewhere else. And depending on the situation, I may ask them to keep a tab on certain things outside of the food log. But definitely using the log in this way can be helpful. Same with if someone's getting frequent urination and it feels like there's certain times of the day where they're going every hour, every hour and a half. So I'll get them to light down the times that they're going. So we can see, okay, they went six times in the morning on this day. The next day they went four times. And we can start to look at, okay, what was the difference between those two days? What did that person have for breakfast or lunch or whatever it may be? So sometimes just having those ongoing issues, putting that down, again, more information to to work from. Um. You want to also be including extra information about things that happened during that day. So, for example, if you were doing exercise on that day, you want to mark it down. And I'd say you want to mark down at the point of where you did the exercise. So not just I did circuits today, it's I did circuits today for one hour between 10.30 and 11.30 because that information is going to be much more useful than just knowing that there was exercise at some point during that day. And again, this is for when you're going to be coming back to that and you've forgotten in a month's time at what point you did actually do exercise. Um, There'll be some times where you normally finish up at the office at 5.30 or 6 o'clock, but work's really busy and you're now not getting out of the office till 7 o'clock or 7.30. You're then getting home and you're then having some dinner and then getting back on the laptop. Put that information down um, because it is then really important. Um, You may have a situation where you have a phone call from your parents and it's a really emotional phone call or there's an argument that you have with your partner and it's quite a a significant argument. Put that information down. It's going to have an impact maybe not just on that day but on the day after or the day after that. So, again, the more information, the better. And it's really important for me when I'm doing this but, again, really important for you to be able to reflect back on that stuff. Um, For women, I get them to mark down on the log where they are in their cycle. So day one of your cycle is the first day of bleeding. And they then mark day one, day two, going all the way up until they get their next cycle. So I may have clients who are getting very irregular cycles when we start out. And they may get up to the point of putting day 65, day 68, whatever it may be. But I want to have that information on there. And this is important because different things can happen at different points of your cycle. And so having that information there, you're like, oh, I'm getting more bloating. Oh, it's fine. Yep, I know I'm in that part of my cycle and that's when more bloating normally happens. And so again, more useful when you're coming back and analyzing that stuff later on as well as in the here and now. Um, So many women that I see have so little connection with their cycle and the fluctuations and how that impacts on them that just doing the process of starting to put the days on the cycle can be really useful at getting someone in tune with their cycle. So they're like, oh, I didn't even know that my cycle was 33 days. I always thought it was just 28 days. I hadn't really paid attention to it or God, I didn't realize that I was getting that moodiness every time around my ovulation. I just just never put two and two together. I'd never even thought of it. But by putting that information there, people start to recognize this stuff. I use temperature and pulse with clients a lot. I think they're fantastic, uh, helpful, objective tools to show where the body is at. And temperature and pulse can link into things like thyroid health and metabolism to different stress hormones, um, a really just a great window into where someone's health's at. And so I will get people to do take their temperature pulse on the days that they're logging for first thing waking in the morning before getting out of bed, 20 minutes after their meals and snacks, and then last thing before going to sleep at night. And very generally, ideally, temperature should be between 36.7, 37 degrees uh, Celsius or 98 to 98.6 in terms of Fahrenheit. Uh, For pulse, ideally, you want to be somewhere between about 75 and 85. 
if people are around 70, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm also happy with people getting up to around about 90. Uh, if I know that they're there with good health and that they're having a pulse of 90 for the right reasons as opposed to stress. And so you want to start to look for patterns in terms of temperature and pulse. Um, I think individual readings are important, but I, it's much more about trends. So what's happening at certain points of the day when you look over three days worth of logs? Are you getting points where there's some real high pulses or you're getting some real dips in terms of your temperature? So maybe in the afternoon time, you notice that your temperature really drops down every single day. Um, are there certain meals where you notice every time I have that meal within an hour, um, I'm feeling really cold or within 20 minutes when I take my temperature, I'm feeling really cold. Um, or there's certain meals where you're like, you know what, when I have that, like two Two hours later, I'm feeling so nice and toasty. And whenever I do my temperature after that meal, it really helps. And so just starting to pick up on certain meals and certain patterns that you notice. But it is very much about the, the bigger picture. And I find that too often when people start to do the temperature and pulsing, it's like I take my temperature and pulse, whatever the reading, I then analyze what happened to that last meal. Was that meal good enough, not good enough, etc. And really too much hyper-analyzing it without thinking about the bigger picture and always thinking about the last meal or the meal before that reading. In terms of temperature and pulse, it is a really detailed topic and I plan to do a whole show on it because I think there is some fantastic information by looking at what a different patterns mean and how this can be interpreted um, in terms of what people should do to actually make those changes. Um, but I don't want to go through it today. Um, I want to just uh, keep going with the other things I think are going to be useful. I actually have um, an email series um, that is based on different tests that you can do at home and I cover temperature and pulse in both of those, uh, two of them that I cover as part of that. So I'll put a link to that email series in the show notes and you can sign up to that um, and have a read of the more detail there. Um, so once you've done all of that, um, with the food log. And those are the things that I really think that people should be focusing on as part of doing the logs. It now comes to the point of analyzing this stuff. And I find that too often people will fill in food logs and then they just forget about it. Like the filling in was the important part and then that's that's over, it's done. The whole point of the logs is for you to then increase your understanding of your body and make decisions about what to try next. So you need to go back through the food logs and see what you notice. And in the beginning, you're only going to have maybe three days worth of logs. And you look at them and you're like, okay, what am I picking up here? Then the next week, when you do it, you've got two weeks to analyze. Okay, how did this week differ from last week? And the longer you do it, the more information you've got. And after you've got one month or then two months, you can compare, okay, what happened this cycle versus last cycle for women? And just the more information you have, the more you can start to analyze that stuff. And so you want to be looking at things like, what are the foods that you're eating lots of and how are they working for you? What are the foods you're eating not so much of that maybe you want to think about including in your diet? Um, what symptoms are coming up fairly regularly? Um, are there any patterns that you're noticing with these symptoms? I, I get a headache, it happens every afternoon, or I always get really tired and it's on a Monday. And what are the things that you can start to try and do to remedy this stuff? And a lot of what I do with clients is trial and error. And that doesn't mean that I'm just uh, throwing shit against a wall and seeing what sticks. It's trial and error where, based on research, based on my understanding, based on what I've seen with other clients, these are the things that I think you should try out from what I'm seeing and then giving those things a go. Um, but it is about let's just see what happens because as much as I can understand research and food and what some paper said or how many vitamins and minerals something has in it, it really does come down to what works for that individual. And so it is about then trying things out and trying it out in a um, structured manner where you're like, okay, let's see what happens when I do this for the next two weeks and trying out one or two or a handful of things at, at once. 
So some examples of what you may see when you look at a food log and what I could pick up. So if someone notices that they're getting poor sleep on the days that they're starting to do exercise or on their exercise days, which is really common and people get a little confused about this. They're like, I should be sleeping more. I've just done a whole heap of exercise, but I'm waking up at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. To me, that can point towards the fact that you're not taking in enough energy on those exercise days. And because sleep is where your body does a lot of its repair work, if it's running out of energy while trying to do that, stress hormones start to come up, it pulls you out of sleep. That's why you're waking up more on those exercise days. So you learn that on exercise days, I need to be eating more to meet the demands of what's being asked there. You may notice that you start to get slumps in the afternoon in terms of your energy. From my perspective, often this links into the fact that in the earlier part of the day, someone hasn't eaten enough. Or it could be that they're having a meal at lunchtime that there's just too much for them um, or that has a high amount of carbohydrates in it and they're just not tolerating that level at this stage. So sometimes the advice is just keep doing what you're doing with time, it will get better in terms of a higher carbohydrate meal at lunchtime, or it could be you need to be having a bigger breakfast and a bigger lunch, uh, sorry, a bigger breakfast and a bigger mid-morning snack. And then I promise you, you're going to get better in terms of the afternoon, in terms of your slumps. And they try it out and they see and most of the time it gets better. So starting to use that information to, to try things out. If someone's noticing they're getting digestive issues and if this is happening occasionally, so once a week, once every three or four days, they get some issues with their digestion where they're getting gas and bloating, it doesn't work so well. Maybe in those instances, it's worth looking at what did I eat for this meal beforehand or what have I had over the last couple of meals that I don't normally have that could be causing a problem. If they're getting digestive issues and it's all the time, so every day they get bloating, every day they get gas, it's then looking at things bigger picture. So it might be, okay, what are the foods that I'm eating all the time that are causing a problem? Um, What are the things that I'm doing all the time that could be causing a problem, i.e. maybe I'm eating in too much of a rush. Maybe I'm leaving it too long between meals and so then when I eat, I eat really quickly. It could be... um, for lots of different reasons. And so it's starting to then analyze why that's happening. Um, Same with common one, sugar cravings after lunch or dinner. Again, this links into often when people aren't eating enough in the earlier part of the day or at certain points, they finish a meal as soon as they put down their cutlery. They're like, oh God, I could really go for some chocolate or some ice cream or that kind of thing. And so from experience, I've noticed that that's typically when people aren't eating enough at the earlier points of the day. And when they start to improve that, things get better. So One thing I would also add to this is it's important to remember it's not just what's happened today or what's just happened for the meal before I've got my symptom. It can be how did yesterday impact or even the day before that. And so I'll often have clients and they'll have things really going terribly on a Monday. And they're like, why, why has happened on this Monday? What am I doing wrong? And my look at my focus is more like, what did you do over the weekend? Or when clients are um, having problems with digestion, it won't always be what happened at that last meal. It will be, what were you eating last night? What did you have yesterday? Did you undereat yesterday in terms of um, what you asked of your body? And so getting out of the habit of just focusing on the previous meal and looking at the bigger picture and what could have come before it a day or two days beforehand. So the point of doing the food log, again, is you want to be learning from this experience. And so what I'm going to go through is some of the things that I think people should be keeping an eye out and wanting to learn. And for some of these, I'll use myself as an example as what I've learned and what I know about foods that support me. So you want to start to do the food log so you can work out what are the best forms of carbs and protein and fats that work for you. So you can have a situation where you have the same amount of carbohydrates in 5, 10, 15 different things, but you react to them very differently. So even though gram for gram there's the same amount of carbs, how that works for you is very different. And the same with protein, the same with fat. 
and it might not be just the amount it could be there's certain foods that you just don't react well with um, so for me as an example in terms of carbohydrates I do so well on things like white potatoes um, I do really well on things like uh, mangoes and bananas but I also know in terms of carbohydrates, I don't do particularly well having things that are high in carbohydrates, um, sorry, high in water content carbohydrates in the morning. So I could have a really high amount of carbohydrates in a smoothie first thing in the morning. It doesn't matter how much carbs that has in it. Within about an hour, I'm going to be peeing. I'll be peeing all morning because watery carbs don't do very well for me at that point of the day. So starting to understand that stuff really helps me to know where I should be eating certain foods. In terms of protein, I'm someone who needs a fairly decent amount of protein and I do much better with things like meat um, and kind of the heavier types of protein than I do from beans and pulses and legumes and that kind of thing. And that's something I've discovered. I've tried to be a vegan years and years ago and lasted about a month. And I was just dropping so much weight while doing it. And so I know that, and look, at that time, I probably wasn't eating enough. So it's not just the protein, but I know from experience that I need um, animal sources of protein. And that doesn't mean that I have like big chunks of steak every time I have a meal or that I never eat beans and pulses because I definitely do. But I know that more of my protein needs to be coming from those sources. And you want to then start to look at and discover what are healthy meals or useful meals or snacks that really work for you. So it might be you know what, I discovered that if I have cheese and um, a mandarin in the morning, that's a really good snack. Or it might be when I have that, it's just not enough for me. And I feel that within an hour, um, my energy is really dipped again. So that might not be as good a snack. It might need to be built up a little bit. Um, but starting to work out what are the good meals and snacks that you can use. Because really, in reality, most people have about... 5, 10, maybe 12 meals that they have on rotation and the same with snacks. Most people have a handful that they use and just kind of repeat and switch them around and so you want to be finding the things that serve you best because if the majority of your snacks actually aren't working for you and you've just got them on rotation, you're going to come into a problem and so working out what are the best forms of those so you can be doing that more often than not. And I would also add to this is there's a lot of foods that are talked about as healthy in inverted commas, and there's a lot of foods that are talked about as being junk or unhealthy in inverted commas. And what I find is there are a lot of foods that are healthy that don't work for people, and there are a lot of foods that are unhealthy that work really well for them. And so using the food log to understand this stuff and getting out of the uh, black and white thinking, and I have to have that because such and such said that's a good food, or I better not eat that because everyone tells me that's an unhealthy food. If something works for you, it works for you. And so really getting to that place where you can entrust your body and your intuition as opposed to having to believe what everyone else is saying. You want to get to a place with the food logs where you understand your best eating patterns. So that's the gaps between your meals. Um, also, when should you do your most amount of eating? So for a lot of clients, I will get them to front load their eating where I'm like, if you can eat a lot of your food at your breakfast, your mid-morning snack and your lunch, you do much better. And having that come in in the earlier part of the day seems to serve you better. And then there will be other people where it's like, really, no matter what you do, you need to have a really big dinner. We've just discovered that that works really well for you. So I think that whatever else goes on, that needs to be a really big meal for you. So using that to discover what is your best eating pattern, using it to realize where certain symptoms are coming from and how to deal with them. And this is a big one because a lot of the times when I'm working with clients in the beginning, it feels like I don't know why that's happening. I get that really regularly, but I just don't know why. And we then get to a point where a lot of their symptoms might not go away totally, but they get to the stage where they are, um, are able to realize why something's happening. 
So it's, I know I always get that when I've had two or three days of being under a fair bit of stress and haven't been eating so well. So when that symptom comes up, it's something that I can go, okay, I need to take a little bit better care of myself. Or it might be that people realize that, you know what, I really discovered that whenever I eat beans that I get bloating. And so I've now decided that I'm not going to have beans or if I have them um, because sometimes you're out with a friend or you're at someone's house and you can't avoid that stuff, I'm going to know that that's going to come up. And when it comes up and I do get that symptom, I'm not going to be worried about it or panic about it because I know why it's happening. And so to understand how and why those symptoms come up can be really powerful even if someone isn't totally eradicating them from their life. Also understanding how to deal with the extra things in your life. So what do you need to do on your exercise days? I know for me personally, I need to do on my exercise days is a lot more eating. And a lot of that eating happens both just before I do exercise, maybe an hour beforehand and within an hour of finishing up. So just knowing that means that I'm much more focused on those days with getting even more in. For women, it might be that they discover with their cycle that for the five days, for the week leading up to their cycle, is when they really need to be doing a lot more of their eating. And I often encourage women to do this and they realize that they're getting cravings around that time, they're getting tiredness, they're getting lots of symptoms. And when they start to eat more at that time, a lot of these symptoms go away. So they then become much more conscious. It's my last week before my period is going to come. I need to up my eating. Um, In terms of busy work days and how to cope with that, I remember when I was a student and I was going into college, sitting in six hours worth of lectures was a real big ask. And I know it sounds counterintuitive because people think about burning calories is running on a treadmill, lifting weights, not sitting in a classroom and focusing and thinking. But that is a real big energy drain. So on those days, I would have to do more eating to be able to manage that. And so just getting to that place of understanding how those extra things in your life are going to change or necessitate you to make changes or adjustments to your eating is really important. Um, Just also realizing other patterns in terms of I get more emotional at certain times with around my cycle. So when that stuff's coming up, again, it's not why is this happening? It's okay, it's because I'm ovulating. I know this will pass within a day and you can be more rational about it. Um, In terms of stuff that's not even about health, I know that I'm most productive first thing in the morning. I do all of my writing in the earlier part of the day and first thing starting in the morning because that's when I can think the best in that way. And so I will structure my day that way. I know in terms of exercise, I'm way better to exercise first thing in the morning. And that's for two reasons. Like I've got better energy and I'm more focused and able to exercise better in that morning. And two, if it's late in the day, it's much more likely that things will get scheduled in and mean that I can't get to exercise and stuff will come up and the exercise gets pushed to the side. So knowing that that's my pattern, I will always make the exercise the first thing in the morning. And that doesn't work for everyone. There are other people who find that they exercise best in the evening time. That's when they're best able to do it. That's when they're always more likely to show up because first thing in the morning when the alarm goes off, the tendency is to just turn off the alarm, do a bit more snoozing, so they miss out on the exercise. So for them, evening time is better. So realizing what your patterns are is is really important. And At some point as part of the process with doing the food log, I look at calories with clients. And this normally happens probably around about the fourth or the fifth consult. Um, It's when I feel that they're probably eating at around about the right range and I've been getting them to be eating more or eating things in a little different way. And we're at the stage where I want to get some more information on what's going on. Or it could be where people are uh, starting to eat the right kinds of foods and the kinds of foods where I'd expect to see some improvements in their symptoms, but actually their symptoms are coming about or are clearing fairly slowly and they're not noticing as many improvements as I would normally expect. And so my suspicions are that 
actually, even though they're starting to eat more of the foods that I think would be helping them better, maybe they're just not eating enough of those foods and that's why it's causing um, a problem or that's why they're not noticing improvements. And in those situations, we may look at calories slightly earlier. It might be after the third consult that we start to do that. But at some point for people that I'm working with, it's about health and it's not about disordered eating, we will do calories at some point. And the way that I do this is I get them to log for a week's worth of eating where they're inputting all the calorie figures. And then after we have that week's worth of eating, I'll get them to do an online calculator and we then work out what they should be including. And the reason I get them to do it in this way is I want to see where they're naturally coming out at this stage before we've had any um, extra information in there. So people aren't noticing that they should be eating in a certain range and then changing the way they're eating to match up to that. So let's see where they first come out and then we can start to look at where they should be actually coming out and how they can change their eating to get to that level. So I'm going to include uh, in the show notes the online calorie calculator that I use with people, Um, but I'm not going to go through it now. It's another one where I actually want to probably do a show all about it, Um, but I did a webinar earlier in the year that covers how to use that online calculator as well as lots of other information. So I'm going to include a link again in the show notes to a replay of that webinar. And so you can have a lot of that. It'll go through that information. Then there's also some other really useful stuff in there. So I really encourage you to watch that webinar. And so We'll then focus on calories for a little while, getting them to get into the right ranges um, for based on what that calorie calculator is showing. And the, the calorie calculator is very much a ballpark. It gives us a starting place. And then we work out, okay, do they need to be a little lower, a little higher? And this is very symptoms-based. It's not so much about what's happening with their weight. That is factored in, but pretty minor in the whole scheme of things. It's more what's happening with their sleep, what's happening with their mood, what's happening with their cycle, etc. And so once we're getting to that place uh, where they're eating pretty well on paper, they're starting to work out the foods that do and don't work for them, the meals that do and don't work for them, the calories seem to be in about the right range. It's at this point that I'll normally do macro ratios with people. So macro ratios is looking at what is the percentage of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats in someone's diet. And the way that I do this with clients is we try out three different ranges and I'll get them to eat to a certain range for two or three weeks. We then get them to do another range for two or three weeks and we get them to do another range for two or three weeks. And at each of those different ranges, um, I will get them to make a bit of a note of how they feel. What are they noticing? What happens in terms of their various symptoms? How did it feel to eat at that range? And some of this can be from a perspective of it's really hard to keep my carbohydrates that low or to keep my fat that high or vice versa. Um, It feels unnatural to me to do it in that way, as well as even though it doesn't feel very natural to me to do it that way, I actually noticed that my symptoms are getting better because all too often people eat in a way that they have just become used to as opposed to what actually works for them. So going through that process can really help. So the, the different ratios that I do with people, um, nothing too crazy. It's all within a fairly neat um, amount. So the first one is 50, 25, 25. So that's 50% carbohydrates, 25% protein, 25% fat. The next ratio is then 40, 30, 30. So 40% carbohydrates, 30% protein, 30% fat. And then the final one is 30, 30, 40. So 30% carbohydrates, 30% protein, and and 40% fat. Um, when I've got someone who's eating at a pretty high calorie amount, um, they typically don't need to be getting their protein up to 30% of calories. So for those last two ratios, I'll normally say, you know what, you can probably keep the protein at around about 25%, maybe even lower than that if their calories are really high, and they can allocate that to either the carbs or the fat. Um, And what I want when they're doing this is I get people to have 
each of their meals and snacks at that ratio. It's not just that their end of day total ends up there, it's that each of their meals and snacks is pretty much on that ratio. Because I really want to get a proper experience of what it's like to eat at those different ratios. And so I'm well aware that this can take a whole heap of organization because people have to uh, work out, okay, what's the calorie goal that they want to be ending at the end of the week, or sorry, the end of the day for? So how much much does that mean that each of my meals need to be in terms of calories for my lunch, breakfast, dinner, my different snacks? And then if I'm eating at a particular ratio, how do I get to that ratio? So how much in terms of potatoes or uh, chicken or bananas or whatever I'm needing to put together is to make that meal work out of that ratio? And so that's a hell of a lot of work for someone to do. So it is pretty much the last thing I'm doing with someone where we're at a point where it can be valuable for them to do this. Because if someone's well under eating in terms of their calories, if their eating's all over the place, if they're they're um, still eating lots of foods that aren't really supporting them, etc. Doing this kind of stuff is really irrelevant and you're just convoluting and making it confusing without ever getting anything out of it. So this only gets done when someone's doing all of the other things right. And what I would say is you wanting, I'm wanting to get the person to notice what happens at those different ranges and what they feel and, and how it affects their symptoms. And it is rare that someone notices that one ratio is this absolute clear winner in terms of when I eat at 50, 25, 25, I just feel amazing. The other two really noticeably worse. What normally happens is that they pick up certain things in terms of, I notice that if I keep my carbs between about 50 and 40%, that's where I felt a little bit better. Or with my protein, I notice that really I just can't let it drop below about 130 grams. When it drops below 130 grams, that's when I start to notice some issues coming up. Above that, it's fine. Um, or when my fat, when that goes above about 30, 35%, I get a little bit more nausea. I felt really not great there, and so I'm not going to do it. Or I had someone recently who would who said that she would, with each of those different ratios, she found that the one with the higher fat, she could eat huge amounts more calories without actually noticing it. And that when she ate 50, 25, 25, she would spontaneously eat a lot less. And it wasn't that she would be hungry and having to force it. It was just that would happen when she came out there. And she's someone who is wanting to lose some weight, who's been eating at a really high calorie amount anyway because she's been needing it. And so the goal or the um, advice for her is let's try eating at 50, 25, 25 because it's naturally bringing down your calories, which can then be helping in terms of weight loss, but you're not having to do this consciously. And look, I don't really do weight loss with people. It's not something I like doing with people, but we're at a stage where I've been working with this person for quite a long time. I know they're doing lots of things right, and this is their next goal. So we're looking at it. So that's how I think doing the ratios can be helpful. Um, but as I said, it's really something that for most people, it's going to give them this tiny little bit of advantage or this tiny little bit of extra information. And it's definitely not where people need to be starting. Most people need to be starting with the basics and using a very basic food log to get them to understand their body better. So that's how I use food logs with people um, where it's pretty much straight up nutrition. And as I said, like that is really the cornerstone of what I'm doing with people. And um, because I use the food log to really analyze it and tell people where I think they should be improving or what I'm noticing in terms of patterns. And it really is about detective work. And I'm at a massive advantage of doing this over someone who's doing this for the first time. Like I've looked at somewhere over 10,000 days worth of food logs and I've worked with hundreds of clients. So I have real experience with doing this. This is my job. And a lot of the suggestions that I make to people are based on science and research, but a lot now is based on intuition and things that I've noticed in terms of patterns or um, what's happened with lots and lots of clients um, from doing this for so long. And so when someone's doing this for the first time, you don't have any of that. 
but I still think that by doing a food log on your own, you can start to pick some information up. And it might not be as much information as I can pick up, but you're definitely going to be getting information there that you can then use to better your health. Um, One thing I just want to cover is there's lots of online versions of doing a food log, um, things like MyFitnessPal, Chronometer, that kind of thing. Um, There's a couple of reasons why I don't use these. And I'm lucky because when I get to the stage of doing calories with people, I've got a food log that I can use specifically for that. So maybe when someone's getting to that stage, using one of those online things can be a little better. But the reason I have for not using it, I'll cover a couple of them. So for... Uh, my fitness pal when you sign up it asks you what your weight is and it then asks you what your weight goal is like i.e where do you want to end up and i think there's even a question of how long do you want to take to get there and it then spits out uh, this is the calories that you should then be consuming each day to get to that amount and the issue is it is a pure mathematical equation that is then implemented to spit out the figure for someone and there's nothing that comes in in terms of rational judgment so people can put in i want to lose a huge amount of weight in a very short amount of time and it then spits out what you'd need to do to get there and a what you need to do to get there probably won't get you there because it's going to pull down your metabolism and mess with a whole heap of things but it means that people are told some really low figures. So I've had clients come to me who are saying that they've been told from my pit fitness pal that they should be eating 700 calories a day. And there is no one that I would ever recommend should be eating 700 calories a day. And so having that as pretty much the first thing that happens when you sign up for something like that, uh, my fitness pal doesn't set it up for a really good experience for someone. Um, for a lot of the food logs, they don't include sections where you can put in the meal timings, your temperature and pulse, and the other things that I went through, or a lot of the other things I went through as part of what I think is useful for people to be keeping tabs on. And so it misses out on that information. When people start to select foods as well, there's often this overwhelming amount of choice. So someone decides that, oh, okay, I had a potato for lunch. Let's look up a potato. And they go to the drop down, type it in, and then there's like 50, 55, 60 different options of potatoes that someone can put in. And so they're then like, oh, what, what type of potato was it? What should I be choosing here? And it becomes really paralyzing because they then try out two or three different versions. They can often get very differing amounts. And I think a lot of that is because some of the information that's input is not always vetted and is not always 100% correct. And so they're there in this place of like, oh God, if I put that potato, I get this one reading. If I put this other one, I get a totally different one. And so it means that people often get stuck at a very early hurdle that isn't that important to them. And so they're at a stage where they really shouldn't be looking at calories. What they should be doing is just getting a sense of how much they're eating, how often they're eating, what are the foods that they're eating. And instead, they're stuck thinking, oh, God, if I put in this potato, I'm going to get a different um, calorie figure to this other one. So for, for all of those reasons, I'm not the biggest fan of the online versions. If someone wants to get to the stage where they've done everything I've described as part of this podcast and then they're doing the more advanced side where they are looking at calories, maybe it can then be more useful then. But too often people are trying to do well, uh, much more advanced stuff than they need to at the point of that. So I now want to cover why I think it can also be useful for clients to keep a food log, even if they're recovering from disordered eating or they're they're trying to use it to help in that way. And definitely not all of the time will I suggest that this is appropriate for a client and that they should keep one. There are definite clients where I might even start out saying I think it could be useful and then we quickly discover that actually it does not work for them and they need to have a break from doing it. So it's not a hard and fast rule that everyone has to do it. And I will add that when I do get someone to keep one and they're coming from this disordered eating, 
it's very basic. So I'm not bothering with temperature and pulse. I'm not normally getting them to do it in the actual Excel document that is in the um, show notes that you're going to download. It's doing it on a very basic thing. So it might be that they're handwriting them out or they're keeping it in a Word document, just really general information so we can have an idea of what they're doing. And Again, I'm always really, really explicit to tell the person that this isn't about judgment. This is about them having a better understanding of their body and what we can do to help them. It's not a tool for them to chastise themselves, whatever they may be showing up as part of that eating. So the reasons that I think it is helpful is it can really help clients in that situation to notice their patterns. So food for them for so long has often been about keeping them thin or using food to manage their emotions or if they're coming from more of the orthorexic side, uh, using food to create health and a health in adverted commas even though that it's actually destroying their health. And so when we're then looking at the food log, we can then analyze it from those perspectives. We can get them to see if that food is being used as fuel and it's not this thing to be feared. We can get them to see there might be times where they're having food as enjoyment and why that's really important. We can start to look at, okay, what things are working and what things aren't. So if someone's orthorexic and they believe that certain foods are really helpful for them and then we're seeing that they're doing it every single day and those foods are doing nothing to serve them, then it can help to create a little bit of cracks in that foundation about their belief around that food. And often orthorexia is just a mask for people wanting to control their weight and it's not always about health. But if someone is really adamant that it is about health, we can start to sort of poke holes in that by looking at what's actually happening. Um, It can be then really helpful as a tool to get people to eat more. And so often when I'm working with people with disordered eating, the suggestion is that they need to be eating more and a lot of their uh, symptoms a lot of their issues are coming from the place of not eating enough to support their body and regularly I have clients who say that if they don't log they end up eating less that they find it much easier to eat more when they're logging than if they don't do it and that It's easier to kind of kid themselves when they're not logging and then get to the end of the day and realize that they haven't eaten so much, whereas if they're actually keeping the log, the chances of that happening aren't aren't the same. And this definitely isn't always the case, but it's happened enough for me to think that it's a useful tool in that regard. Um, It's also good to help clients from burying their head in the sand. So the food log really shows things in black and white. And so often clients can say, oh, no, I am eating more. And then when you look at the log, in reality, it shows that they're not. Um, Often clients can be using the log and they're eating more. And then they stop doing the log when they start to slip back into their old habits and they don't want to face up to things. So often when they say, oh, I haven't been keeping the log so much lately, it can be a flag to me to be asking, okay, like, what's going on with your eating really? And it can be a flag for them as well to realize, you know what, when I start not keeping the log, it's normally because I'm wanting to revert back to my old eating habits. And when I revert back to that, I don't want to be keeping a record of it. And so just using it as a tool to stop people burying their head in their sand and and, and not wanting to face up to things. It can be a tool to help clients have more variety. And a lot of the time when people have issues with disordered eating, there's some real uh, structure and regimentation in the foods that are allowable or not allowable. And so again, you're seeing this stuff in black and white. And so this having the same meals and the same snacks again and again and again. And so having this can then be an easy way to be encouraging people to be trying out new things and adding in more variety. And when I say easy, I mean easier. It doesn't just suddenly become so easy for people to eat more food and to eat variety just because they're keeping a log. But it means that they can also be adding in uh, information about that experience and also their symptoms. So they notice that they had a food that they haven't eaten before and actually they didn't get the indigestion that they've been getting every time they're having salad for lunch or whatever it may be. So using that idea of the variety, not only to just expand someone's um, 
eating capacity or expand someone's um, what they're eating as part of their, their diet, but realizing how that variety is then helping or changing their symptoms. It's also really helpful for people to remember their improvements. And when people are making improvements, it's normally done at a slow pace. It's normally done in a way that you almost have amnesia as to what it used to be like. So clients can then have bad days and they feel like they're making no progress. And so I can then get them to say, look, go back and have a look at your logs from six weeks ago or from two months ago and compare what you've done today versus what you were doing then. And people can then realize like, wow, okay, in comparison to where I was two months ago, I'm in so much of a better place. And I know I'm having a tough day now, but me thinking that there hasn't been any improvements is just not true. And so having that stuff um, to refer back to can be really helpful. Um, the final one is also just from my perspective is it allows me when I'm working with someone to be making some nutritional or some health advice. And I know in these situations, a lot of what I'm working on with people is breaking their disordered eating patterns, but they are also going to be getting different symptoms. And so if I'm noticing that someone's getting lots of bloating and we then look at their log, I can point out that, you know what, I think it's because you're having all of these raw foods or you notice it's happening every time you're having nuts that you're getting this go on. So maybe let's try and find a better snack or a better lunch for you to be having in that place. And that might be really difficult for someone to to make that change, but really making that connection between their symptoms can be um, a helpful tool for making that change. Um if they're getting problems with their sleep, it might be that I make suggestions of what they can do to help with that. And it might be try having a snack before going to bed, or I think it's coming from, from this place or whatever it may be. And often this advice um, can be pretty generalized in terms of, okay, you're getting these five or six different symptoms. The first thing I would be thinking about with each of them is you need to be eating more. So it's not about specific foods. It's not about specific um, really small things. It's on the whole, bigger picture, you need to be eating more. And when you start to do that, it's going to help. Um, and look, a lot of the time when I give this information to people, they don't always act on it. Um, but it allows me to at least be offering that in advice and offering that help to someone so that if they then choose to, they can then implement it. So these are the reasons why I think having the food log, even for someone with disordered eating, can be can be helpful. And maybe it's more helpful when I'm working with someone than someone doing it on their own because I can be helping to point that stuff out and I'm helping to keep someone a little bit more accountable. But I still think if someone's approaching it with the right spirit – in terms of this is something that helps me become more in tune with my body as opposed to this is something that's going to keep me on the straight and narrow and I'm going to use this to chastise myself and make myself feel bad. If people are using it for the right reasons, I think it is definitely a useful tool across the board. So that is it for this week's show. Um, I hope you found those um the tips and suggestions helpful. Um, what I would say is too often people hear this kind of stuff and they think this sounds really good. Um, yeah, I think I could really benefit from this. And then they do nothing about it. So they don't keep a food log. They think it's going to be a useful tool and it's something that they'll, they'll do at a later stage and come back to. Intellectually knowing stuff does basically nothing unless you actually implement it. So if you found this show useful, if you think it could be helping you out, please give it a go. Try it out. See what happens. Do it for a month, for a couple of months, and just see how useful it is for you. So that's it for today. Um, join me next week when I have another guest on the show. And until then, have a good week. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.sevensevenhealth.com.